The market simply will not crash under these circumstances. It's proven to us that it doesn't care about Apple earnings, credit downgrades, CPI inflation, or even the latest labor report. And the sellers continue to fail at the lows, at least on the S&P side of things, over and over and over and over again. Count them, that's four times. So let's build a game plan that's based on reality, based on the data points for the coming week's worth of trade that keeps us on the right side of the market. As always, check out the links listed down below in the description, hit the thumbs up button and subscribe if you've not already done so, and stay tuned until the end of today's show. I've got four and a half additional trade ideas to share with you that you won't want to miss. With that said, let's jump right into the charts. So kicking things off on the SPY weekly time frame, talking about candle structure and location as we always do. For structure this past week, we're certainly dealing with a red-bodied indecisive doji, where in the upper wick we know the sellers step up on the CPI rally, and in the lower wick the buyers step up on the PPI gap down. So not too much progress made in either direction, however, I would concede that of course the close is beneath the opening print, giving us the red-bodied bar in the first place, so sellers do win from a structural perspective. If we think about location on the bar-to-bar -bar count, we do have ourselves a bar-to-bar -bar lower high and lower low, so once again, the sellers take the win from a location standpoint. However, was it really all that bad? I mean, if we think about the actual close in relationship to the prior weekly low and even the prior weekly close, not too much progress was made in the downward direction. And the lower wick is also at a very interesting location if we give ourselves a little bit more context such as this, right? We've really been tracking this as a weekly balance range. And if this is going to turn into a break, retest, higher low, and continuation of the overall weekly uptrend, that is the key place to hold, right? 444, as we know from the SPY daily time frame chart. And so far in the lower wick, that's exactly where the buyers have been stepping up, or at least the sellers have been failing to push the market lower. The key line in the sand is still the set of soft lows here, closer to 432. And I would just remind you that we are in an overall weekly uptrend still with lows, higher lows, higher lows, higher lows, soft, higher lows here, 432. And along the way, highs, higher highs, higher highs, higher highs. And we're pulling back from, this is the key component, right? we're pulling back from a set of higher highs. I would be more concerned about the weekly trend changing if we were to take out the soft lows here at 432. Obviously, that would require quite a bit of downside activity in the coming weeks worth of trade. I wouldn't look at that as a high probability outcome, especially considering some of the other data points that we'll explore in today's episode. What can we tell from an anchored VWAP perspective? Any confluence from this? Not really. This anchored VWAP from the breakout of the ascending triangle of this pattern back on over here. It's not really in play. It could be this upcoming week towards the lows. If we do get a flush towards the midpoint, that number is 439.16 as of right now on the weekly time frame. How about if we take a look at the volume profile? Any confluence with levels back here? And absolutely there is. If we draw out our high volume node, that's exactly the top of the weekly balance range, aka SPY 444. And that's where we're coming in for a retest. So would it make logical sense that a high volume node could act as support when testing from the top side down? The answer to that that question in my eyes is absolutely furthering the case that so far so good. Again, I don't really believe that the market is going to see an outright crash if we're holding on to some of this key support. How about the Fibonacci's? Let's take a look from this perspective. We've been really tracking our 61.8 on the retracement from the all-time high to the October low, and that's still at the set of soft lows, much closer to SPY 430, 432. Let's not split hairs. As long as we're above that, the more weekly bars, the more time that we spend above the 61.8, as we know, over time, it doesn't have to happen this week, next week, next month, but more time we spend over the 61.8, the greater the odds of the 100% retracement, and that is not in jeopardy so far. Let's take a look at our daily. Let's first evaluate the expected move. If you're not familiar with this study, check out the video tutorial in the top right hand corner. If we're contained by the upper bound of this week's expected move, the number is 452.26, and that of course is a lower high from here to here, but it's an equal high to what we experienced in last week's worth of trade. If we're contained by the lower bound, the number is 438.96, rounded off to 439, and that of course would be a lower low and an equal low on par with our last major set of daily higher lows back here. So expected move is definitely bearish from that perspective. I also am not a big fan, at least from the bullish side of things, that the upper bound is on a retest of our overhead supply, that 451.50 level that we've been tracking for quite some time. But before we start getting too pessimistic, the expected move is bearish. Let's talk about trend, right? Because the daily uptrend is still intact. 
No matter how difficult it may be to believe that, it is intact with lows, higher lows, higher lows. This is a pullback. This is the do or die zone. We know that this level, 444, or the gap fill from the prior CPI cycle at 443, is the key zone to be watching on the S&P, right? We're pulling back from a higher high. This is do or die for the higher low. So not only is it the gap fill reversal, not only is it the prior breakout point from in here, not only is it our daily 50 SMA, not only if we take out a Fibonacci here, is it roughly our 61.8 from low to high from the last higher low, to the latest higher high, 61.8 is right around in this area, right? It's also, we haven't looked at this in probably two sessions now, but if I throw on the trend channels that we've been tracking, the brighter one is the major trend channel that we're sitting in, the darker one is the minor trend channel, and we're coming right into the lower bound of that trend channel. If I just sketch in the bottom of that area, that's the support trend line coming from anchor, touch number one, touch number two. So there's a lot of things going for the S&P here closer to the 444 and 443 gap fill reversal area. I don't want us to lose sight that we're still in a daily uptrend. Yes, we have moved into an hourly downtrend. We'll see that in just a moment. But for the most part, there's an opportunity still to find ourselves a daily higher low. It's not going to be easy if we do get any sort of upswing out of this four trend continuation because once again, we do have to contend with the overhead supply. We've already seen a rejection there once on the CPI rally, and it is being priced in as the upper bound of this week's expected move. If any buyers are still trapped from up here and they want out for break even, that'll be the first place that they start to sell the market, right? So 450-150 is still difficult, but I'm not losing faith yet that there's an opportunity for a daily higher low at this key zone for all of the reasons that we just discussed. From a pattern perspective, I find it extremely interesting that after a rejection of the overhead supply from CPI, a very weak close, right? We reversed all the way from high of day off of the overhead supply, closed extremely weak, back down at the three at this point, equal lows. Why was it, you have to ask yourself this question, why was it on the PPI gap down from Friday, the sellers were unable to capitalize on that momentum and send prices down towards the bottom edge of last week's expected move. If stronger sellers were going to be getting involved in this market, the gap down from PPI should have been a gift and a sort of momentum kickoff for a move in the downward direction. It simply did not happen, reaffirming that our key level here has held on the Friday gap down. And to boot, we didn't see any bearish internals. We'll get to that screen in just a moment, but the internals were incredible incredibly mild all week. So the main explainer for what's going on here on the daily time frame chart is that we're getting volatility in the downward direction from short-term catalysts, Apple earnings, credit downgrade, Bank of Japan news, CPI, PPI. All of that is short-term volatility in the downward direction, but you're getting longer-term buyers who are recognizing that, hey, this is not a half-bad place to be looking for entries on the S&P. Even the most basic entry point, right? Could be, oh, I'm going to buy the 50 SMA, right? There it is. That's exactly what we're seeing take place. And it's the push and pull between short-term volatility in the downward direction, yet longer-term buyers recognizing a pullback opportunity, which is causing, in my eyes, this craziness of intraday volatility. So I don't think the daily chart is fully resolved here. Once again, I'm not pounding the table for new all-time highs. I'm not saying it's going to be easy going forward, but I do think there's an opportunity for a daily higher low for all the reasons that we just discussed. Let's take a look at the hourly time frame chart get a little bit more granular here and actually build out a game plan based on levels with some early week situations. So it's quite clear that this balance range is the driving force for the S&P 500. We have a two-day balance. CPI looks above and fails. We rotate to the bottom end of the range and we produce all of these very precise lows. We just saw that on the daily as three back-to-back -back equal lows. So Friday's gift of a gap down once again moves back into range. So we can start to think about look below and fail, the exact opposite of what we experienced from the CPI move, right? Where when we look below the bottom of the range and we move back into the range, if we get a higher low over the range uh, bottom, the range threshold, which would be 444.90, we're looking for the rotation to the top, which would be 448.75. That would be a bullish indication, obviously. The other thing to point out is that we've repaired the very precise and mechanical lows. We've put in good excess at the lows with the gap down from the PPI move, repairing the structure, making it more firm of a location to push away from in the upward direction. In theory, the auction has been completed properly at the bottom instead of improperly when everything is back to back and very precise. Let's take out the anchored view apps from an intraday perspective and then we will build a roadmap here. What do we see from this perspective? So 
This is still a key zone, and I would still argue that this is still a key zone up here, those anchored view apps. Just as a reminder, this one is coming from back here where we've been gauging our last daily higher low from. So what's the roadmap? It's quite, in my opinion, fairly straightforward and it deals with this balance range, right? If we're getting price acceptance over 444.90, because we do not have aggressive internals in the downward direction and because this can still hold as a daily higher low, if we're getting price acceptance here, I would look for the rotation to the top of the range at 448.75. Now, when and if we get there, it's key to understand that yes, we absolutely are in an hourly downtrend. It's very logical that sellers may try to step up and produce an hourly lower high. That would look something like this with highs, lower highs, lower highs. This could be the next place for lower highs. So it's going to be a battle in the upward direction, but I would imagine this could act as a first target on price acceptance over 444.90. If we can get above that, that's where things get even more interesting. And this is the even more bullish look on a higher low over 448.75. If we pull back off of 448.75, so something that looks like this early on in the week, we get the rotation and then we pull back. If we can find a higher low still above 444.90, you have to envision the opportunity for a very sloppy but there inverted head and shoulders, or at least the attempt at a rounded style bottom with decent excess at the lows and holding your daily 50 SMA, all the confluence we just talked about here, it looks decent on a higher low pullback holding above 444.90 if we pull back off of the 448.75 in the first place, right? If there's just an Armageddon type sell, everything hits the fan early on in the week, I would wait patiently to definitively break down underneath 443, something that looks like this, intraday lower highs, and then we can start to trade for downside outcomes. Then the daily trend would definitely flip more towards a neutral bias. We would look for 439.50, lower bound of this week's expected move. And then beyond that, if we do need further targets, we have 436.75. Let's take a look at some supporting evidence. Market internals are always exhibit A. If you're not familiar with this screen, check out the video tutorial in the top right-hand corner. Simply put, there's no reason to be overly bearish when the internals are this mild. No individual day got even close to negative 300 million from a volume flows perspective, and the net flows on the week close out at negative 143 million, not even remotely close to negative 500 million, which would classify a substantial read. In terms of the advanced decline line, only Tuesday gets down below in trend lower zone, but as we talked about from Wednesday's update, we trend higher into the close. It's not the greatest look, but it's definitely not as bearish as it could have been. It's not overly indicative of stronger sell side activity. The cumulative tick is extremely telling. Look how many times it flip flops back and forth through the zero line multiple times this week. Friday is completely flat as a build. There's just simply no excuse to look at the market and say, hey, the sellers are really building an overwhelming edge here. So it would be a reasonable thing to say, okay, Matt, well, if it's not overly bearish, it's also not overly bullish. Why are you bullish on the daily time frame chart? And it boils back down to the prevailing winds, the prevailing winds of the weekly uptrend, the daily uptrend, the evidence that sellers had multiple gifts, aka PPIs gapped down on Friday to send this market lower with momentum, and they were unable to capitalize. So we will change our tone if we have to. If we notice that individual days are getting down here towards negative 300 million, if we're getting an advanced decliner that's in trend lower zone or a cumulative tick that's building out closer to negative 5,000, we will change our tone, but we do not have any evidence of that as of right now. Now. Market profile is always exhibit B. If you're not familiar with this screen, check out the video tutorial in the top right hand corner. For the most part, we want to see what was going on in relationship to the two day balance range from the Tuesday and Wednesday session here. So Thursday, we attempt to break out as we know from the CPI catalyst, but is it a successful breakout? I would argue no. Look at where the value area and the point of control are from the Thursday session. Not only do we see the candle structure closing weak at the lows, but the point of control and value are lower in the profile and contained within the two-day balance range. So this would be a failed breakout from the buyers. If we look at the lows of Thursday's range, we have a poor low with only one TPO of excess. It needs repair. So when we gap down on Friday, we're technically repairing the poor low. We put in fantastic excess. Look at that string of A periods down here. And also make note that we have a staggering lack of volume underneath the two-day balance range. Nobody is willing to commit new money shorts down here. And you would also say the flip side about the longs. It's not like buyers were just stepping up aggressively. Um, but where does value and the point of control end up? Inside of the Thursday range, and we're left with a poor high. So the idea of a look below and fail is totally logical here with a reason to break out over Friday's high because it's a poor high, that level needs repair. So we should expect that if we test it, we can look for a break and that would trigger the look below and fail. And we could potentially look for 45 
25.20 as a target in the ES. Overall, what's going on with the value shift and point of control shift higher, or at least back in range on the Friday session, would agree with the look below and fail analysis from the SPY hourly timeframe chart as well. Jumping back on over to the platform to evaluate the weekly performance of our sectors reveals that the XLE for the energy sector led the pack here up 2.85%, followed by healthcare, real estate, and utilities. And as we know, most of those do fall into the risk off category of the market. The XLK is at the bottom of the barrel tech sector, heaviest weighted sector of them all down a whopping 2.9%. Not a great look for risk on. Same thing. It's followed by XLY discretionary. Materials are the outlier, but financials and communications, most of the risk on sectors took a beating this week. All of them are red. So the biggest threat is not so much the rotation because this rotation will keep the pullback healthy in the S&P 500. Rather, if we get full-blown core Relation, that's where concerns start to step in. So here's the energy sector from a structural perspective. We did break the balance range in the upward direction here. We've come in for a range double. We're at prior structural resistance as well, 90-30. So if this pulls back, it begs the question, you better see some positive rotation out of the XLK and the risk on sectors. Otherwise, this starts to look more so like correlation or the opportunity for it in the downward direction. Now, don't get me wrong. We can catch ourselves for a daily higher low up against 87.30. But if it pulls back, you need to see green out of the other sectors. Otherwise, the market will be red on that day. Next up, XLV. What's going on here? Second heaviest weighted sector by market cap. But as we know, D4 defensive, it's coming in for an equal high. So the trend is starting to neutralize here with the lack of a higher high. But there's the opportunity for a daily higher low. As long as we're above 134.75, this will be a neutral force for the markets. And once again, because it's the second heaviest weighted sector by market cap, this is a big driving factor as to why the S&P is not breaking down more aggressively. Let's take a look at real estate. What's going on over here? Lightweight sector not doing anything stuck sideways in this balance range. If it's up, it's up. If it's down, it's down. Lightweight sector, lightweight pressure. XLU, this is where we start to get concerned about the full-blown correlation, right? We talked about this the other day. We are getting that lower high underneath 65. There was the 100% retracement, putting in bear flag consolidation here with upper wick. So if we continue to consolidate out and then ultimately flush underneath 63.75, the next downside target is 61.85. But once again, this starts to speak to full-blown correlation. If you're seeing the risk off rotation, which is going to keep the S&P pullback mild, it means things like utilities, healthcare, energy, even consumer staples, right? It means that those things are getting bought up, cushioning some of the blow over in the heavier weight sectors. So if this pattern does play out and everything is now bearish, that to me, once again, is the largest threat for this week in terms of downside. Next up, XLI. What do we see over here? A balance range. Treat it like a balance range. It is hanging out towards the top. I would say because of that, overall posture is more bullish than bearish. If you wanted to make the argument for a head and shoulders, that's logical. However, it's not a head and shoulders until we're actually underneath the neckline. That is 108.15. So instead, I would just argue play the balance, right? If we're above, upward pressure for markets. If we're below, downward pressure. We're literally in the midpoint of that range as of Friday's close. I would say because of the overall trend, just like in the S&P, right, because of the overall trend here, I would maintain more of a bullish outlook uh, and be willing and open to changing tones if we flush the lows uh, in the case of a move lower. Let's take a look at the XLP, what's going on with consumer staples. As we know, this is one of those sectors that wants to get bought up if we're seeing a defensive rotation. And it looks menacing, honestly, at that 7470. So if there is going to be full-blown correlation, I could totally envision the XLP sweeping all of these equal lows to try to put in excess and end the auction properly. Because because all of these are so precise, just like the same concept in the S&P, that is turning into a weaker and weaker and weaker level day by day. If we put in excess and snap back above, that's a different story. We've cleaned up the structure and now we're looking good for the upside rotation on some sort of daily high or low, but it looks like a threat to the downside first, which once again pairs nicely with the idea of correlation to the downside. So as we drift through the sectors here, you know, you can you can understand the circumstances as to where we will change our tone on the SPY daily. It's if everything starts falling off of a cliff early on in the week. But if we are getting that rotation still, it's probably not all that bad. And we continue to see mild drift or even a rally, a relief rally, even if it's just that, would be welcomed, right? What do we see out of the XLK? We've got to start changing our tone here because we are underneath the 167.65. This is a fairly aggressive move in the downward direction with no counter trend moves in between. So I wouldn't be surprised if there is a little bit of an uptick here, but obviously, your threats are just for a big time daily lower high. You could set a daily lower high anywhere underneath 175.70 at this point in time. So if we were to get back in here, you know, maybe we neutralize out into the future, but at least on the first impulse, the thought would be for a lower high, which would be a bearish indication for markets. The XLK, if it's going to improve, dramatically needs 
you know, confidently a higher low over the 170 mark before we would even start thinking about, okay, maybe we're back to neutral, right? This uh, Friday breakdown, and you can see it's a gap fill reversal on Friday's session, is really not healthy whatsoever for the market here if we're looking for the bull case and the higher low pullback. So keeping a very close eye on the XLK, the structure here would indicate to me at least gap fill reversal, close week at the open. It's really not ready to move in the upward direction. You need the confidence. You need the proof before the market's going to rally. Look for intraday higher lows if you're thinking about trying to take the SPY in the upward direction. Next up, XLY. What do we see from the consumer discretionary perspective? Amazon tried to save the day with the gap up, but we are drifting lower and we are underneath this as a balance range. The 50 SMA could be the saving grace. However, at this point, the XLY is neutral. It's not really acting as bullish pressure for the market. So we will keep that in our back pocket. XLB for materials, lightweight sector. You could call a head and shoulders absolutely breaking the neckline here, which we did on Friday, we are getting some price acceptance underneath that 82.85 doesn't look all that great, right? If anything, it would be neutral, maybe a weekly higher low off of this area here at 82 daily 50 SMA, but it's certainly not going to be helpful for a major market reversal, even if it does rally because it's such a lightweight sector, not thrilled uh, or even really that concerned with what takes place out of materials. XLF is where we've got to be a little bit more thoughtful because it is a heavier weight sector. It is a risk on sector. This is a mild pullback. It's not falling off of a cliff. There's still an opportunity for daily Daily higher lows here, right? We've got lows, higher lows, higher lows. As long as we're holding over 34.65, this is helping the bull case for your S&P 500, right? This is a mild pullback. If you isolate this and just start thinking of it in this perspective, right? That's a daily bull flag, breaking the flag. A measured move takes you from here to here, stacked from here to here. That's, that's I don't want to say off the screen, uh, but we would certainly be looking for a higher target somewhere closer to, let's just round off here and call it 37, right? So 37 is an upside target measured move from the bull flag perspective, not calling for it this week, but if the flag starts to break, it's certainly helpful for the bull case out there in market. So as we're at this tipping point, I think it's worth keeping intraday a very close eye on what the sector dynamics are like. And even if you're not going to watch every single sector chart structurally, have a market minder window open with your percent change from open. This is not available by default in Thinkorswim. You can check out the website, Trading Scripts. Um, we, we offer this as the percent change from the open, not the prior day's close but communications to round things off here. And then we'll take a look at the ratio grid. This is stuck in a balance range. There's still an opportunity for a daily higher low here. Inverted hammer from the Friday session doesn't look fantastic. And you could make the argument once again that maybe this starts to turn into head and shoulders if we break the neckline here, which would just be a flush of the bottom of the balance, which is at 66.75. We rotate to the next structure, daily 50 SMA and 65.55. That would help the case for full-blown correlation. So once again, at the end of the day, or the beginning of the morning, as we've been saying recently, if everything is red, you're getting full-blown correlation, those are the days to not try to catch the falling knife in the S&P. When we have rotation and it's a mixed bag between some sectors being green and some sectors being red, that is a healthy pullback. And so far, we are dealing with healthy pullback, not full-blown correlation. Here's the sector ratio grid. If you're not familiar with this screen, check out the video tutorial in the top right-hand corner on how to set this one up. Overall, I think it speaks for itself. The risk on look is fading from the market. You can see that in the tech sector here, and you can see it in the consumer discretionary sector here. Breaking the 50 SMA, threatening the 50 SMA after a clear daily lower high. The glue holding it together is really the XLF with a beautiful looking uptrend here. Lows, higher lows, higher lows, highs, higher highs, equal highs, threatening a break from this beautiful little you know cup and handle type look here from the ratio perspective. So that's holding the risk on look together. And once again, one of the reasons why you're not seeing full-blown correlation to the downside, even pair with that, the XLC, which remains high and tight, just consolidating sideways up here above an upward sloping 50 SMA. The risk off look is starting to creep in with something like your XLV breaking the 50 SMA in the upward direction here. The energy sector is taken off like a rocket ship over the 50 SMA, but you're not seeing dramatic outperformance out of consumer staples or even utilities. Utilities is generally thought of as the premier risk off sector. And it's not really upticking here. It just made a lower low as a matter of fact. So I'm not overly concerned yet that we're moving into a full blown risk off look. But once again, you can start to see how the uptrend is losing some of its shine based on what's happening here primarily out of the XLK. We can look at some specialized ratios like the XLK versus the XLU. And you can see that we've got a threat at the 50 SMA coming in for a lower high 50 SMA test. We have not made a lower low yet, but we're right on the cusp. So the market, once again, is at this tipping point where we have to pay very close attention. You don't want to be early. You'd rather be late 
with confirmation. That's my motto, at least. If you want to be early, that's on you. But I'd prefer to be late with confirmation than early and wrong. Here's the XLY versus the XLP. Same concept. Daily lower high. No lower low yet, but threatening to lose the upward sloping 50 SMA. If it does see a more aggressive pullback, there's an opportunity for a weekly or even monthly higher low here around the 2.1 area. Taking a look at the dollar, you can certainly see the look below and fail, which is starting to confirm with the first higher low above 101, the bottom of the range here, and consecutive higher lows happening in here over the last week's worth of trade. So with this higher consolidation and the look below and fail pattern in play, I would imagine we could at least come in for the equal high attempt here at 103.50, which would be a bearish indication for equities down below. How does the gold contract feel about that type of move? If we take a look at the forward slash GCs, we are incredibly weak at the equal lows here after a lower high dead cap bounce, inverted hammers on the Thursday and Friday session. So I would say that yes, that agrees with the dollar moving higher, in theory, putting more downward pressure on equities over here. Let's take a look at our interest rates, what's going on with our TNX 10 year. You can see we did break out aggressively on the Thursday and Friday sessions. And it's my belief that it's not just the bonds market, which is making the 10 year rate move right now. I think there's actually the expectation that the Fed might actually raise rates one more time, even though the Fed tracker tool is not pricing it in. I do not believe that this previous CPI report accurately reflected the increase in commodities pricing. And really, it was the services section of inflation that drove the CPI in the upward direction, not goods. And we'll get to the CPI report in just a second. But what does the inverted ZT have to say about this? What you'll notice is specifically on the Thursday session, take note of this, right? Look how we made a lower low on the morning sweep and then closed at the highs and got follow through on the Friday session. So at first, we're moving lower and then we're higher. This would be an indication that yes, if we see this uptrend continue off of a higher low, if this starts holding as a higher low and we break out here, that would be a big time indication that it's very likely the Fed would raise rates one more time into the end of this year. Let's take a look at the tracker tool, though, and see what's actually going on. Still seeing higher odds for a pause from the Fed in the next meeting, even post CPI announcement, which is right here. And once again, that meeting will take place on September 20th. There is no August meeting. So this is kind of counter to what we just talked about on the inverted ZT, and I would prefer to watch the inverted ZT then the tracker tool, I think there's something sneaky that might take place here, even if the Fed doesn't explicitly raise rates one more time. If you look at the higher for longer column right here and then go out to the very next one, if we start to build this out further into 2024 and there are no aggressive rate cuts baked into the back half of 2024, that would obviously be something different than the market's expectations and not be exactly the same as a rate hike, but it would have similar implications with higher for longer tightening financial conditions. If we take a look at the CPI, report, I just want to highlight this one component here where shelter accounted for about 90% of the increase in CPI. And if we scroll on down to actually see what shelter was, it's right over here at 0.4, which is the exact same as the prior read. So it begs the question, as we know, everybody knows that gasoline prices have been going up. We'll take a look at the gasoline chart in just a second. It comes in at a 0.2. Why was this not elevated? Let's take a look at the gasoline chart and I'll just show you the percent increase. So this is the UGA uh, gasoline fund. And if we come in from the lows of early May up to what was going on over here, it's a 35%, almost 36% increase. Even if you want to come in from the beginning, let's go to the beginning of July. So 7.3 up to the top, that's a 21 just about incre percent increase. That's a substantial increase. And I do not believe that that has accurately been priced in to what's going on here with the CPI report. It's not to say that I know better than the market, but I'm just concerned that there is the potential for another rate hike if inflation continues to revamp in the next couple of reads. We know that Powell said he will be data dependent. I wouldn't be surprised if he says, hey, the report went up. Of course, we're going to do another rate hike and the market freaks out and so be it. I'm sure the bears are actually kind of clapping and saying, hey, Matt, you're seeing properly. And I would concede, yes, that would likely be a bearish data point for the markets if we get one more rate hike. In my eyes, what really sent the market lower on the Friday morning session was not so much the CPI report. As we know, the chefs out back did a great job of cooking up a beautiful beautiful number 3.2, 3.3 expected, but unemployment claims came in hotter than the expectation, 248 versus 231 expected. Now this is initial unemployment claims. The continuing unemployment claims actually went down, which would be an indication that people are losing employment and then finding it quite quickly and then getting back out into the workforce, right? Instead of the initial here, which is a little bit elevated. So the buyers are, and the bulls are trying to build the argument that, hey, continuing claims came down, initial was a little bit of a miss, 
That's why the market rallied. CPI wasn't really all that bad. We're moving in the right direction. So it's a push and pull right now. I would really be interested in what comes out for the August read in the September CPI release. How about the risk appetite charts? You can currently see that the TLT ratio to the S&P is still underneath our resistance trend line. And the uptick that we saw here was in fact nothing more than a counter trend move in the face of a pre-existing downtrend here. You'll notice that we already rolled over on the Thursday and Friday sessions in the downward direction. It doesn't mean that it can't turn into something more substantial, but being underneath the trend line and already rolling back over and seeing the TLT in this move right here would indicate to me once again, this is nothing more than volatility not a full-blown flight to safety. We could take it one step further and have a look at our bonds. We're seeing some uncertainty here still with the short-dated bonds currently continuing to outperform and remaining elevated in relationship to the longer-dated bonds. So once again, that uncertainty would be an indication of volatility. And if we take a look at the LQD corporate-grade bonds versus government-backed risk-free bond, what you'll notice is that it is rolling over actually underneath a descending 50 SMA. So if this is going to remain a risk-on look for the markets, you want to see this drift lower back down towards the equal low and not see any sort of swing here back up and over the 50 SMA. So far, so good out of the IEF versus the LQD corporate grade bonds. Let's take a look at our HYG because once again, there is a staggering divergence over on the HYG where we continue to drift in the upward direction. Even though we've broken the trend line, we do still have a higher low into the close of this week, whereas the S&P obviously continues to produce lower highs and lower lows along the way. So this would tell us to keep an open mind about an oversold bounce in the S&P to make that daily higher low a reality that we've been talking about. What about Bitcoin just to round things out on the digital gold? Anything interesting over here? Absolutely nothing to update you on. So we're moving along. How about our market breadth as the pullback has continued across the broad market? New highs versus lows does find itself back down at the zero line, which I must admit is a bit of a threat for our daily higher low thesis that we've been building in today's episode of the weekly watch list. The only saving grace, as we know, is that in the early stages of a recovery, we can tend to interact with the zero line quite a bit, even pulling back slightly after the fact in here. What we wanna avoid is a look like 2022, where we do see some more substantial reads in the downward direction. We're not there yet, but we're keeping a close eye on new highs versus lows. We can balance that analysis out though by taking a look at the SPX A200R, stocks that are trading above the 200 SMA in the S&P 500. This is a weekly time frame chart and in my eyes is a direct mirror to what we saw on the SPY weekly time frame chart. Remember we said that the closes were relatively unchanged. That's exactly what you're getting here out of the SPX A200R and still above our 50% mark. Let's take it one step further. SPX A50R, stocks trading above the 50 SMA on the daily time frame chart. Uh, you can see that this is more aggressively lower. So if we are going to get the higher low thesis to play out in the SPY, we want to see this bottom above the 50% mark. If it starts to dip a toe underneath, I would definitely change my tone to being much more neutral in the S&P as a whole. What about the equal weight S&P? This is going to be the RSP analysis, and this also deserves a very close zoom in. Notice that we did get ourselves a higher low on the Friday session, unlike the weighted equities down below, which produced a lower low. So as long as the RSP is over the 150 mark, that would be a supporting piece of evidence for the daily higher low pullback in the weighted SPY. How about the Dow? Any divergences taking place over on the industrials versus transports? Absolutely not. So good to go from that perspective. Let's take a look at volatility. So the VIX did close weak on Friday session underneath the 15 handle, which has been acting as a floor ever since we gapped up on the Bank of Japan news way back over here. So if volatility is collapsing, you would expect that the VIX is backing off aggressively, right? Well, it did move lower, but it's still elevated in the overall range from over here. So I would keep an open mind to the VIX not actually being quite ready yet to drift underneath 15, unless the VIX early on in the coming week's worth of trade makes a move underneath 90. So keep an eye on that relationship. We can take a look at volatility futures. And for all of the purists, this is moving into a more comfortable position with deeper contangos in the VIX futures, as well as the nine versus 30 day VIX. And the one day VIX is also consolidating inside bars inside of the Wednesday session. So we'll keep an eye on this one. If it does perk up up and over the high of this range, we will be concerned. We're going to start using that as an indication for the one day VIX, keeping a close eye on it. If it does become a valid signal, then we'll start to do something interesting with it. But for now, just keeping tabs on the level, I'll give you the number. It's at 1660, 1660. If we're over that level, I would imagine that the VIX itself does start to perk up. The VIX could also make the move over 103. But so far, so good. As long as this continues to drift in the downward direction, this stays underneath the zero mark. It would align nicely with the higher low pullback theory for our SPY. 
QQQ weekly time frame chart. What do we see here from a candle structure and location perspective? I would make the argument that we clearly have a much different bar than the SPY. Solid red body, not enough upper or lower wick to read into from a psychological perspective. Extremely weak close at the bottom of the trading range. This is far weaker than our S&P, clearly. If we think about location on the bar to bar count, big time lower high as well as a lower low and the close is more substantially underneath the prior weekly close as well. If we think about our weekly balance balance range like this, we are back in the balance range as opposed to the SPY, which was supporting above the top of the balance range. So much more bearish over here on our QQQ. The 360 soft lows from the bottom of the range are in play if we do see continuation. From the weekly trend perspective, you wanna hold there for a more constructive look. If we start to flush it, there's not a lot of structure through this section of the weekly time frame, and the larger back test would be the monthly higher low at something like 320. Not calling for that in the coming weeks worth of trade, just pointing out where structure ultimately is. We can throw on the anchored view apps and see what's going on from that perspective. The AI Mania Anchored View app is in play. That's the low of last week. If we do start to see a bounce, perhaps that is one piece of evidence that would support, hey, this is making sense. We're at a logical area. But we could take it one step further and have a look at our volume profile because this too is stacked at the low of this prior week's range, right? If we do something like this, there you go. There's your high volume node. That's where we ended last week's trade. So if we do start to see a reversal, you do have confluence between two weekly things here. And maybe that's enough for the market market to start to perk up. But obviously the threat is now that we're in the range, there's the opportunity for an intraday, or I should even just say daily lower high that sets this up as a weekly beginnings of a head and shoulders, right? Some sort of lower high that then flush and flushes a neckline, perhaps gets you more firmly through the thin structure in the AI mania breakout. So thinking about that here on the weekly time frame, where's the 61.8 retracement from the all time high to the October low? It's a little bit further underneath us. However, if that head and shoulders does ultimately pay pan out. And let's say over time, we break that neckline, that would be a logical target noting also that we have two lower wicks. Let me zoom in a little bit more on that two lower wicks here supporting off of the 61.8. And as we know, it's also just a key inflection point, which would improve the odds over time for a 100% retracement. So watching 350 from that perspective. So to sum it up on the weekly time frame, 360 soft lows become important. If we do go further than that, about 10 points lower 350 is your Fibonacci sequence that you want to pay attention to for the next major indication. Let's take a look at our daily time frame chart. We'll pop our levels back on and get a closer look at what's taking place here. Expected move is more bearish out of the QQQ, obviously, indicating that not only are we already at the equal low from the last piece in here, but we're expecting once again, another equal low to back on over here. The lower bound is at 358.24, big time lower low. If we are contained by the upper bound, it's a lower high underneath what we have from here to here. That number is 374.35. Big difference with the QQQ and the SPY is that obviously we are in a QQQ daily downtrend with lower highs and lower lows already in place. We have failed to hold the 50 SMA. And also on the Friday session, you can see that we consolidated underneath the bottom of the three day balance. No surprises here, especially considering the analysis that we just did on the XLK. The next thing to talk about is the hourly roadmap going forward. What do we see from this perspective? I think the game plan is pretty straightforward. If we do this, we know that look below and fail can take place up and over 367.65. If the SPY is trying to move higher, this would be a supporting piece of evidence for the SPY daily higher low if we get the look below and fail on the QQQ. From a trend channel perspective, also on the hourly, this becomes a little bit more clear, right? Just note that we're sitting on the bottom of the trend channel. Is the ideal location for a new money short at the bottom of the trend channel or the top of the trend channel, right? We can kind of put two and two together here and say that fishing for new money shorts down here might not be the wisest idea unless you're a short shorter duration trader, and you're looking for a break lower high and retest to confirm underneath 364.50. Your next target, 361.60. And then as we know, the bottom edge of this week's expected move and prior structure at 357.50. That's the downside levels. And once again, just like in the S&P, if this does go look below and fail, and it does rally to the top of the multi-day range back here at 372, if it's going to be more constructive for a reversal out of the QQQ, if this is all the pullback that we're going to get, if we see this, right, as a larger time frame inverted head and shoulders, your neckline would then become 372, the better indications for a stronger daily reversal off of an hourly reversal pattern 
would look something like this. I know there's a lot of scribbles on the screen, but you get the idea. We would need the confirmation after a higher low here to here, get over the neckline, and that would be at 372. That would be the most constructive look that the buyers could potentially put into play throughout the upcoming week's worth of trade. How about the anchored view apps here for our QQQ? Any confluence with the major levels? And I would argue, yes, 372 anchored view app from the gap down. That's the credit downgrade back here. So if we do go look below and fail, that becomes your target. And 372, you're likely going to look for lower highs there. We know that the QQQ is already in a daily downtrend. I would be more optimistic about the QQQ putting in a reversal pattern up here. It could be a simple inverted hammer, could be a five or 15 minute double top, head and shoulders. Any of those patterns go at 372, looking for a short to keep the daily and even hourly downtrend at this point in time intact, right? You would basically be trying to look for a short at the top of the trend channel there. Once again, the better construction of long look is if we can breach it with a higher low to build out inverted head and shoulders as we just talked about anything beyond that big battlegrounds here confluence with prior anchored view apps and 375.50 overhead supply from your last set of major lows. How about the internals for the NASDAQ side of things? Much more bearish over here. The substantial downside reads from a net volume flow perspective are negative 600 million. We hit negative 596 million. So right on the cusp out of the NQ and the NASDAQ side of the market, clearly much more weakness. If you're looking for shorts, it makes total sense that you want to be on the tech side of things. This is where there's the most room to pull back. We're already seeing more weakness over here. If you're looking for shorts, don't do it in the S&P. Look at your QQQ where there's already a clear edge to the bears. You'll also notice on the advanced decline line, instead of being clinged towards the zero line, a majority of these days this week, we're underneath the zero line, much more of a bearish indication. And your cumulative bills, instead of sloshing back and forth through the zero line, mostly bearish in last week's worth of trade. Last thing to look at for our QQQ is the market profile. And you can see that the value area and point of control were underneath the multi-day bounce balance range in here on the Friday session, furthering the idea that there is weakness, there is price acceptance at these lows. We have an inflection point here, and we will be open to the idea for a short-term intraday reversal like this. But for the most part, the bears do have the edge on the NASDAQ side of the market. IWM Russell 2000 and the small caps. What's going on here from a weekly structure and location perspective? Structure is much more similar to the NQ NASDAQ side of things with a solid weekly red bar here. A little bit of a lower wick, but not nearly as substantial as what we got over on the S and P side of things. We did close week at the lows, so structure will go to the sellers. If we think about location bar to bar count, lower high and a lower low, once again, the close also is more substantially removed from the prior weekly range. So location is also more bearish than bullish on a bar to bar count. However, remembering the trend here, we've got lows, higher lows, and we're pulling back, searching for higher lows, ideally over 188 on the weekly time frame chart. IWM has been very uh, cleanly putting in balance range, balance range, balance range. As long as we can hold that 188, things are looking constructive in the upward direction. And over time, we know that breaking the larger weekly balance here is much more constructive for the broad market as a whole. If we bring out the anchored view apps, we know that we've got ourselves a pinch going on here on the IWM. So the all-time high anchored view app and the October low pinching in here, retesting, the pullback is retesting the all-time high anchored view app, which is confluence with that 188 level and also confluence with the anchored view app from here. So all looking pretty solid at the 188 out of IWM. We can throw on our volume profile as well and see if there's any confluence from this perspective. 188 is the top of this prior volume shelf back here. We are pulling back from high volume nodes. We basically just built these out as high volume nodes as we've been transacting up here in the last couple weeks worth of trade. So if we do see a move in the upward direction, the top of this range closer to 197s would be seen as resistance from a volume perspective as well. Let's take a closer look at the daily time frame chart. We'll throw our levels back on and we'll get a bit more granular with the analysis for the coming week's worth of trade. The expected move here is definitely bearish, being a lower low and a lower high, lower high from here to here, lower low just underneath our weekly support zone there at 188.25. Overall on the downdraft, you can see from CPI, we did reject the overhead supply, right? This is a key level at 193.50, and we certainly rejected it with strength on the Thursday session towards that high of day. If we remain underneath 191.25, I would look for the continued drift to test the weekly zone of support at 188.25. We would be moving through our daily 50 SMA for that to be taking place. The other thing that builds confluence with the 188.25 is if we come in with a Fibonacci from the low 
to the high, there's your 38.2. So in theory, this beautiful stair-stepping pattern we've been getting in the upward direction, one, two, three, it is playing nicely from a Fibonacci perspective. Once again, the key line in the sand on the IWM this week really boils down to that 188 level. Let's take a look at the hourly time frame chart, get a bit more granular here and build out that roadmap as we typically do for the early stages of the week. You can clearly see there's your balance range. We are getting price acceptance underneath on the Friday session underneath that 191.25. So if we're below that, it's hard to be a bull, just like everything else. If we do go look below and fail, looking for the higher low back above the level, you need the higher low now that we've broken down from this overhead supply and already put into place a rejection for an hourly downtrend here. So please make sure you get the higher low, not just a flash of volatility above 191.25. You can look for the rotation, something that looks like this, to the retest once again at 193.50. If we're below, as we pointed out, 188.25, anything that's really going to be far more constructive for the buyers, just like everything else. Most of these patterns are very similar. I hope, hope that you get the sense of that right now, right? If we do something like this, we make it here. So let's go a bit more granular. I'll get really granular for you, right? If we do this, higher low, we get the rotation to here, and then we go pull back. If we can higher low back above 191.25, as we know, that sets up the inverted head and shoulders. And even then, it's not a straightforward long here until we can break and retest higher low over the neckline and back inside of the overhead supply, which would be above 193.50. So that's the really optimistic look in the upward direction. If we do drift lower, uh, based on the weekly structure and all the confluence that we have here, 188.25 seems like a very firm area of support. We'll update you on Wednesday if we have to with lower targets. Let's take a look at the internals for the Russell side of the market. Insignificant outflows pegged to the zero line in here, although we did have some more bearish days on the Tuesday and Wednesday session. Thursday gaps up, gets close to that trend higher zone, not quite all the way there. And you can see the flip-flops back and forth through the zero line out of the cumulative tick here, a very flat and muted read on the Friday session. So I would say much more similar to our S&P weekly uptrend, weekly stair steps in the upward direction, daily trend is, is it's breaking down from the overhead supply, but for the most part, the 188 hold with neutral internals like this, I would just be hard pressed to go firmly against the weekly trend, which is trying to build out as up right now in the Russell. Willing to trade for downside outcomes, but as scalps only. Scalps only. That's the difference, right? Your time frame and expectations of the distance that you can travel. Here's the Russell futures. And I want to point out very similarly to our S&P 500, the value area and point of control from the Friday session are back inside of the balance range from over here. They did not build out like the NASDAQ underneath Thursday's low. If you've made it to this point in the video, I just want to take this moment to say thank you. It feels like the mojo is back. I'm having a good time. Hopefully you are too, and we're learning things along the way. Let's kick off our core list of companies with none other than Apple. What do we see here on the daily time frame chart? Definitely dealing with a bear flag. However, on Friday's session, we have a look below and fail into a gap range from the past here, and we closed back above that 177 mark. Now, it's not an outright long just because of that, but if we take a look at the hourly time frame chart, if we can start to get some price acceptance and a higher low over 179.75, I would be willing to trade through the retracement of this thin structure. First target 182.65, then 185 on the upside. If we remain stuck in the consolidation range, obviously we are looking for downside outcomes over time. And your next big structural target on the daily would be at 170.40. Let's move along and take a look at Netflix. This is still an hourly time frame chart. Great breakdown on Netflix from the Friday session, breaking the balance range here, producing multiple interest day lower highs up against that 427.50 level, looking for continuation to our next target at 415 here. I would even say if we come in for another hourly retest for the lower high up against 427.50, that would also be tradable for shorts here. Once again, 415 does become the target. If every, you know, like the broad market, if we do go look below and fail, it requires a higher low above to confirm the failure. And then we can target the top of the range. That would be 440.75. But given the weakness on Friday, given the fact that we've already put in consecutive hourly lower highs here, not really looking for that as a primary outcome as look below and fail. I would think that this would be a higher probability. Next up, what's going on with Tesla and Mr. Musk over here? This is at an interesting inflection point because if I go to the daily, uh, Netflix did not produce a hammer with that, that hourly structure we just saw, but Tesla certainly did. So if Tesla can break up and over the hammer high, not only is it a daily buy signal, but it's a look below and fail, right? So if we just go back to the hourly chart now, there is the range, look below and fail. You could even see it as an hourly ascending triangle way down here. If I zoom in on that, that's probably easier on the eyes. 
there's your ascending triangle breaking that level at 243.50 looks pretty good for something that does this or like first higher low pullback over view app to then rotate to the top of the range because of the daily hammer structure if we can't get up and over the 243.50 your next downside target is the full gap close at 235.16 then beyond that is 221 let's go back to the daily chart to see where that's coming from 221 also a minor gap actually that should be a yellow level at 221 as your next structural target we know tesla is already in a daily downtrend with multiple lower highs and lower lows along the way just like we talked about i believe it was on the qqq you don't really want to be a new money short at the bottom of the trend channel and tesla just produced a daily hammer at the bottom of the trend channel so think about that before you just jump in both hands with a short on monday morning let's take a look at google what's going on over here this is still a daily time frame chart we're looking at the daily time frame so this is interesting because we pointed out that this even though we were balancing here let's go to the hourly this will illustrate the point a little bit more firmly even though we were balancing like Netflix, Google was not as much of a short because Google, as we know, if we just scrunch this chart out, is all above our prior you know, accumulation zone now at this point. Now that we're above it, we can say that, yes, it is accumulation. We are trading higher. So Google was not a short on the breakdown of that 129.10. Remember that we were neutral in here. If we drifted into the gap, we could start to look for short outcomes. That's going to remain the same for the early stages of this week. We're already starting to get look below and fail. So any confirmed higher lows over 129.10 10, I would look to trade for upside outcomes in Google to the top of the range at 13150 into the early stages of this week. If we break it, your next upside target is 13365. Next up is Metaverse. What's going on with Zuckerberg's fantasy land over here? This is week at the lows after a full gap close, right? So here's the full gap close. Friday session closes week at the lows after filling the individual gap from the Friday move lower, and we're just consolidating over the 301. We are in an hourly downtrend with highs, lower highs, lower highs, lows, lower lows, lower lows. So on the lower low, is it the ideal location for a new money short? Probably not. But any attempts that fade for a lower high beneath 310.75, I'd be looking for entries kind of in that area. You could even look for if we were to rally up into the gap close area once again, 305.15, 305.25. If we reject off of this kind of area here for a lower high, sets up the equal low flush after a day or two of consolidating in a new little balance range. Next target, 297.25. Then your daily 50 SMA at 293.68 as of Friday's close. Next up, Nivda. What's going on over here? Earnings are coming up. When are earnings on this? I want to give you the exact date. 823. 823 earnings for NVIDIA. And you can see that we've broken down from this as an overhead supply. The bears are rooting for a big time head and shoulders. Just remember, it's not technically a head and shoulders until we're underneath some sort of established neckline. It would require the lower high. So just like we talked about, I believe it was actually over on, what was it? Was It, it was just meta just a second ago. We need some sort of lower high here, just like we need a lower high to short into out of meta, right? And Zuckerberg's fantasy land there. So here's the hourly time frame chart. We can start to get that hourly lower high rally. If we break out over 411.75, you could look for a rejection here up against 421.75. And that starts to build the case for your reversal back in the downward direction, keeping us underneath the overhead supply, right? There's the overhead supply. This is like not even close. That's overhead supply from here weighing on NVIDIA in the downward direction. So 421.75 key rejections uh, for continued downside. And if we do break 407, your next downside target is 395.50. Next up, what's going on with Softy? Bill Gates and Softy here. So there's your balance range, much more of a hammer-esque type candle. So more so like Tesla, honestly, where if we could get over 321.85, looking for the rotation back to the top of the range at 326.50. That's your look below and fail situation. If it does turn into an inverted head and shoulders over time, you really need more price acceptance over 328.65 to be more constructive on Microsoft for a trend reversal. If you remain underneath 321.85, your next downside target is quite a ways away at 313.50. Last but certainly not not least, we've got the mini beast. What's going on with Amazon? It is getting bearish consolidation. I would not go short Amazon until we're working our way into the gap, which is underneath 137.09. If we do that, looking for some sort of new downtrend to be established in that range. Uh, until then, this to me is much more so neutral. And the reason behind that is because we know that we've gapped up above this prior range from here. So it's difficult to be a new money short into prior resistance, which now has the opportunity to act and prove itself as newfound support. I would want to see a new downtrend develop inside of the gap range before looking aggressively for shorts out of Amazon. If we hold up in Amazon and move higher, over 139 is interesting for this, 140.50, and then beyond that is the top of the earnings gap up that's closer to 144. 
Four and a half trade ideas for you, and then you are on your way. CRWD CrowdStrike is up first on the chopping block. What do we see here? Certainly back-to-back -back inverted hammers on the Thursday and Friday session underneath and rejecting a now downward sloping 50 SMA after a 100% retracement. So could this be a lower high dead cap bounce, equal low, and then a flush? Absolutely. But as a day trade, as a scalp early on in the week, if we take out both of the inverted hammer lows at 147.20, you could look for the rotation to the bottom of the range here at 142, giving you about five points to be trading for in the downward direction. From there, you could look for follow through, but just understand that you need to manage expectations because the overall trend here is up from this perspective. We would be breaking key support. I will give you that and your next possible target could be closer to 135, but just make sure that we're actually breaking firmly before getting overly aggressive for down downside, right? This is just a day trade. Anything beyond that, manage your expectations. Next up, UNH, one of the last big boy stocks, as we like to call it, price point over $500. Love the options chain here. Just wish there's a little bit more liquidity. Nonetheless, bull flag. I mean, this belongs in a textbook, right? If we can break out up and over 512.25, next overhead target comes from this prior pivot top at 526.50. What I also like about the bottom of the flag range is extending this left, all of the consolidation is above this prior range in here. So this is totally bullish consolidation. It's on the heels of an earnings catalyst. If we can get follow through, looking for that to play out in the upward direction. Not interested if we start to spend time underneath the bottom of the range at 501. Next up, we've got a two for one whammy, which is why I'm calling it four and a half. MRVL is for Marvel. And this is a too far, too fast type of situation, right? Too far, too fast on the breakdown here coming into key support. So if this requires a lot of discipline, right? If the broad market is making a move in the upward direction, you could look for a Marvel dead cat bounce here in the, you know, obviously the upward direction. Now, if you are a bear and you're saying, oh, I'm really actually interested in this gap close underneath, that's fine. But after a 100% retracement, do not be the first one to short it dead on the lows. Wait for some sort of lower high, reshort on the lower high or the subsequent equal low flush, and then we can look for the gap to close. If you're looking for that situation, your lower high wants to be underneath 61.50. If you want to fish for long, down here, make sure you have an intraday setup on a five or 15 minute chart and the broad market is moving in the upward direction. If it's not moving in the upward direction, this trade is off the table. I want to be very, very clear about that. You are not trying to catch a falling knife if the broad market is not working in your favor. And the same thing holds true for trade desk. Too far, too fast. The double top has played out, but it is a 100% retracement into key support here at 74. If we bounce and you want to look for a short on the lower high, it's underneath 81. 90 and a rejection on the back test of the 50 SMA here. It's also a back test of the neckline of the double top there. So 91, uh, excuse me, 81, 90 out of TTD on a bounce. And once again, I want to be very, very clear. We're all on the same page, right? You're not catching the falling knife unless the broad market itself is actually moving in the upward direction. One last trade idea for you that is not so contrarian to round out the four and a half trade ideas here. Uh, what do we see over here on BA Boeing? If this is going to turn into a double top, it needs to break the neckline. We've already got the inverted hammers in place. Friday did close week underneath some of this consolidation. Looking for the rotation here, 230.80. And if it goes, we've got nothing but thin structure to retrace all the way back down to the breakout point at 218.50. Not interested if we make a new higher high up and over 241. That's going to do it for today's episode of the Weekly Watches. I feel like I've got the mojo back. Hopefully you enjoyed today's episode. If you do, let me know down below in the comments section or by giving the video a simple thumbs up. I hope to see you in the pre-market Prep 815 Monday morning sharp. And with that said, I wish you a green trading week.